50 billion is outstanding. People have, have defaulted our customer. Now I'm talking to our customer. Today the webinar is focused on our customer. That is not a member, but our customer. About 150 billion is in default. We have about 157 cases in court with our customers because they have deducted and they have not remitted. But what is worrying and what, uh, where all this conversation leads to, as we keep doing this, this conversation is leading to the member. And what are we saying? The member, it saddens us and we shall keep fighting. At retirement, after you have worked for our customer for all those years, only 5% of you go home and you are financially independent. Meaning if, your, if our customer, your employer was able to give you medical insurance, you are unable to provide yourself medical insurance when you leave them. If they are able to, uh, to afford you a vacation, to afford you to go to it for a team building and sleep in a nice hotel, when you leave employment, you are unable to do all those things. So these statistics need to be addressed. And we feel like this is the conversation. So there's been a gap. The employer keeps giving our customer. The employer keeps giving. He gives to our member. He gives to NSSF. And what do we as NSSF do? We keep engaging the member. So the ultimate beneficiary here is the member. The member keeps receiving. You receive from your employer. You receive from NSSF. All our programs have been focused on you, the member. We do CSR for the member. We are doing financial literacy, personal financial literacy for you, the member. Interest comes to you, the member. So many things come to you, the member. 20% to the member. Everything is coming to the member. There is who is looking at the employer, our customer, the person who keeps giving us money. He keeps giving you money, keeps giving NSSF money, and we need to fix that. So NSSF is coming up with a business mentorship program where businesses can mentor businesses, where businesses can talk to businesses, where businesses can grow other businesses. We want to provide a platform where we can create synergies, where we can enable mutual benefit programs. You have heard of a good, um, you've heard of Stanbic doing something good. How can you replicate it? Let's get Stanbic here. You've heard, if you have heard Fairway being one of the nicest hotels how, and how they have revolutionized their service, how can they, can they share their story? So the mentorship program is going to get us to get those stories to you. How can you interface with the people who have done what you think you need to do in your business and how have they done it? Can we as NSSF be an enabler to reach, to bridge that, to get the bridge between you and that person you want to be like? You are on, when I say that person, I'm talking about the businesses. Today we're talking about businesses. So our customer, our customer is the base in all this. And our customer, that is the business. We want to Everything forms around our customer. I know uh, it is said it forms around our, our member. No, it, everything forms around our customer and then serves our member. So who are they beyond contributions? We, as NSSF, we don't want to look at our customer just for contributions. That, that one, 500 million. The numbers, that one gives us 20 million a month. This, that, we want to go beyond that. What is it that they can do? What is it that we can do for them? And we are saying we may not do much, but we can provide a platform. So as NSSF, let's be an enabler. We are going to be an enabler for these services. What is it that our customer can share with another customer for mutual benefit? These are not free services. We are looking for mutual benefits. We are not looking at becoming an NGO. We are looking at having conversations that impact on both sides. Our programs will include the mentorship programs. They will include topical engagements. This morning, we are going to have an engagement. They will include market platforms, community platforms. They will include so many other things that are on the, on the offing and will be reaching you as, as, as customers to just participate in, in these. And all this is for the ultimate benefit of our member. When we have good relations with our customer, our member benefits, our customer will not default on our members contribution so as nssf for us it's a win a win and a win but how do we start allow me to take you through how we start as nssf we are here we are providing the platform but we are not the experts remember apollo is paid heavily highly by you the members to do 
uh, to, to talk. Actually, mine is to talk. But I'm not an expert at businesses. I do not have a $500 million, $500 million uh, shillings business in Uganda. No, I don't. So I will not be of value to you when you want to establish one of a billion shillings. But yet I'm the one who is highly paid to talk. So as NSSF, we shall do our part. Let's provide a platform. Then let's bring in the experts. I'm privileged and honored that we are making partnerships and we have brought in the entrepreneurship organization as one of the platform, one of the partners to do this. So when you talk about the entrepreneurship organization, it has its inception in 1987, started in 1987 for entrepreneurs and founders of businesses making more than $1 million in annual revenue. So as NSSF now, just to take you back, as NSSF, where we are paid to talk and we do the talking, we talk to organizations like this and we are able to influence and ask them to partner with us. And the entrepreneurship organization has been kind enough to partner with us. Now, the entrepreneurship organization, as you see, is talking about, it has people, its members are people, are businesses that have an annual turnover of $1 million. They have a global footprint in over 61 countries and they have one in Uganda. Today I'm privileged and for the next six months we're going to be hosting, uh, the president of the entrepreneurship organization in Uganda will be hosting a series of these engagements for the benefit of you members. He will be bringing his members who, every member you see here, I'm not, I'm not, calling, uh, I'm not calling snipers on them, but every member you see here commands a million, over a million dollars in annual revenue. Every person you will see here, every business that will be represented, will be commanding that much. And they are okay with URA, by the way. Don't, don't worry, we are not uh, whistleblowing on them. So there's an opportunity to learn and to grow through the entrepreneurship mentorship program. So the program that I'm calling the NSSF Business Mentorship is actually going to be provided by experts who have done it. What has NSSF done? These guys have done it. So let them share their story. Let them share their story. Let them share their businesses. And for the mutual benefit of everyone. So I've done a lot of talking and let's see who we have with us here. I'm about to go away so that the, the millionaires start talking. Uh, if my back office team is kind enough to share with, we need to know who you are. Who is it that is with us? Are you male? Are you female? We need to know if you're a male entrepreneur or a female entrepreneur. We need to know your age bracket. Are you 20 and below? Are you above 20? Are you between 20 and 30, 30 and 40? And we need to understand, are you an entrepreneur? And what stage are you at? Are you thinking? Are you at the thinking stage? Are you at the starting stage? Are you at one year, two years, three years? Kindly share with us. We need to know when, this, when my panelists start sharing what they share, they need to customize it to who they are talking to. So they need to understand who you are, your age, and what level of business you are in. And we shall close this poll in the next five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Thank you so much. Uh, my dear panelists, today we are talking to 63% females, males, sorry, 37% females. The majority in the age brackets are between 31 to 40. The minority are below 20. We have 20, 26% between 21 and 30. We have 16% over 50 years. We have 24% between 41 and 50. What are their levels of business entrepreneurship in their entrepreneurship journey? And some, these are some of the questions you also need to answer. Where are you in your entrepreneurship journey? We will not ask for the age, but for the gender we shall establish. Um, we have the majority. We have the majority of our of our members attending in the thinking stage. Most of them are thinking. They have not started, but they are thinking. 37% of our tenants today are thinking. 
18 percent are starting they have thought and they have started something 11 percent have a business under one year 21 percent have a business between two years and uh five years and 13 percent have a business over five years so gentlemen those are our panelists allow me to introduce to you to introduce to you our panelists today the president of the entrepreneurship organization jaffa azar he's also the managing director of fairway hotel fairway hotel has been courteous enough that every time i host my panelists they take them for breakfast i'm only going to ask that i'm included on that list but uh probably i also have to make a million dollars but fairway hotel has has provided these services has given us a home has given us quite a number of uh, um you you've, you've you've seen one of our of the videos them teaching us how to do backyard farming that is all fairway hotel and it is courtesy of azar thank you so much azar thank you so much for coming up with this program he has also been gracious enough in 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 our studio here we are hosting about three or five we will always give a chance for about five maximum five people to come in in the studio here and meet just have a talk one-on-one -on -one with these gentlemen and all that has been designed by him as thank you so much for that allow me to, in, to, to to invite you to introduce the other panelists and take on from there thank you so much thank you very much for having us um my name is Azar Bandali Jaffer. I'm the managing director of Fairway Hotel and the managing director of Uganda's Finest, a recently launched company that works with young entrepreneurs trying to grow their businesses. It's sponsored by MasterCard Foundation and Private Sector Foundation, and we're doing a lot of very creative and great things, so come check us out. EO is an organization that brings together successful entrepreneurs from around the world with the purpose of growth, helping us grow our businesses and helping us grow ourselves. Today, I'm honored to be here with two fantastic panelists. We have Vikesh, who is the managing director of Vicklin Distributors, and Andreas, who is the, man, who the CFO of Great Lakes Coffee. Please, Andreas, if you could introduce yourself, tell us a bit about your business, what you do, and how you got into this business. Uh, thank you, Azar. I'm delighted to be here to be part of this panelist, and it's a great initiative. Um, thank you to NSSF for hosting and for you, Uganda, putting this together. Um, so my name is uh, Andreas. Um, I'm third generation in coffee farming. Apologies. Um, I'm third generation in uh, coffee farming from East Africa. Um, I'm very proud of my heritage. My mom is um, is a Ugandan from Western Uganda. Uh, my grandfather migrated to Africa over 90 years ago, and uh, yes, is what we do. Um, my coffee story um, started uh, about 40 years ago from the day I was born. I was born on a coffee farm uh, in Eastern Congo. Um, I was educated um, in Africa and uh, I moved back to Uganda uh, around 1999 where I joined the family business. And uh, what we focus on is um, empowering uh, Ugandan coffee farmers. Uh, we specialize in uh, high quality coffees. Uh, with a very big focus on ensuring that uh, farmers have access to the world's best markets to sell the products, uh, ensuring that they're able to create both economic and social impact uh, for their families. And above all, um, we are very proud to represent Uganda. Um, we are in a part of the world where coffee is grown. Uh, our neighbors, um, some of them supposedly have more famous coffee brands than us. Um, but I, I think Uganda is on the rise and um, it's a great honor to represent Uganda, Coffee Uganda, the brand Uganda all over the world. And um, I'm looking forward to the conversation we're about to have today. Thank you. And Vikash, kindly, if you could introduce your business and yourself. Thank you, Azar. I'm humbled to be here today. Um, so my name is Vikesh Dauda. I'm a third generation Kenyan. But um, I've actually been in Uganda for the past uh, 20 years, since uh, 98. So I pretty much just actually didn't even finish university and then was called over to join the family business in Uganda. And 
joined the family business, which is House of Dowder. You know, we make Britannia, Biscuits, Splash. Over a period of time, I moved around the region of East Africa, working for various family businesses, and then decided to settle down in Uganda, where my heart um, really was. And the opportunity to came uh, through family members who were in a similar business in Kenya and to to do some distribution and represent some wines and spirits company so we i started the distribution of wines and spirits i'm also into distribution of um footwear in uganda so when you see your umoja rubber slippers that is a footwear that we do um in the wines and spirits we represent a french company called perno ricard uh, which is one of the largest um, manufacturers of premium wines and spirits in the world and um, so that was started in 2012 and that's been my journey so far yeah we as entrepreneurs are sometimes defined by our business so people don't know me as a czar they know me as fairway hotel so when we talk about the why as an entrepreneur it's not just our why as a business owner, it's our business's why. There are various driving forces behind every entrepreneur that keeps us motivated. And we're going to tell our stories and discuss more on those topics. But I'd like to start by discussing what is the problem that our business is solving? Maybe we can start with you, Vigesh. Thank you, Ezra. What I realized in Uganda was that, well, the oldest manufacturers of wines and spirits, which needs representation, you know, which needs presentation, uh, representation in Uganda. And that's a problem, right? So Wickland, what Wickland does is solves a problem of importation of the products, distribution and marketing of these brands and make them uh, market leaders in their categories. So that's how I see, that's the problem that I see that uh, we're solving as Vicland with the company. Thank you. And how about yourself, Andres? Sure. Um, so I think um, there's a bit of background story to this. Um, my family has always just traded coffee, you know, buy and sell, buy and sell. And this is traditionally how um, our business has been run. Um, maybe it's because of my age, maybe it's because of um, my influences of having traveled uh, all over the world. Um, when I came back to Uganda, I realized very fast that while everybody in the world is drinking coffee, uh, farmers don't necessarily have a voice uh, or they don't have a platform where they can actually tell their coffee story and be able to maximize their, their incomes. So when I joined the business, um, that became my focus. It was, okay, um, we know Uganda can produce great coffees. Uh, we know that uh, most of us have somehow grown in agriculture. Uh, our parents have always had a plot of land, you know, whether to feed us or to make money. So my big focus was how do I remove people in the supply chain who are not adding value to farmers? So how do I go straight down to the source? Uh, how do I engage with farmers? How do I understand what are the problems they're facing? You know, um, is it prices? Is it uh, production? Is it quality? And try and solve those problems. Uh, and while we solve the problems, we don't just leave them. Uh, and I think that's a key here. So it's one thing to solve the problem and give them the tools, but then we also are an enabler to then market the product overseas, right? So um, that's how I see uh, our business model it's just all about how to create uh, economic and social impact for farmers, give them a voice, how they can maximize and put Uganda on the world map for coffee. Thank you. So I think that's our first tip for those of you watching at home is you need to be solving a problem as your business. So whether you're a hardware shop or a chapati stand, what is the problem you're solving? Without a problem, you won't have a customer. Secondly, we'd like to talk about our mission and vision as a business. The backbone behind any business is understanding what you do well and focusing on it and making it your mission. So when I look at Fairway Hotel, for example, 
It's our mission as a hotel to exceed your expectation as a guest. When you come into a hotel, you want to have a meal. We understand that you're here to eat, but to exceed your expectation is more than just giving you food. And that is what we focus on as a property. Vikesh, what is your mission as, your, as a business? How did you develop it? And how do you get your whole company behind that mi mission? Good question, Azhar. So the mission for, for, for Vikland is to be masters, to be the champions in distribution of wines and spirits with a focus on customer service and building strong and transparent partnerships with suppliers. Now, when I think about that mission, how, how we first came out with this was we, we actually had a strategy retreat with all of our staff. And we said, what do we stand for? What do we believe in? You know, and, and so the, the, the mission was not developed by me sitting in, in the office, but it was actually uh, developed uh, with the, by, through inclusion of the whole team in the company. Um, how I see mission is, well, I'm a keen mountaineer, so climb a lot of mountains and the way I see the vision is the summit. That's where I want to go. And that helps you with the direction. It helps you with alignment of what you, where you want to go every day. But what I do for the company is not necessarily just focus on the goals or the vision. What I focus on is a mission. Mission to me is what needs to be done consistently uh, with discipline every single day. And how we communicate it is when you walk into our, uh, into our offices, it's displayed in, into the wall, it's printed. We, what I do is I take certain aspects of it and personally communicate it to the team on a regular basis. What is it that we're doing? What is the reason we come to the office? You know, and that's the mission. What is our mission for the day? Um, so that's how we, how, how, how I go around that. Thanks, sir. You know, when you look at your mission, it's, it's what you do well. When you look at your vision, it's where you want to go. So I often give this analogy to my staff when we're doing trainings. You know, when you, when you go into a taxi park, you don't just point at any matatu, jump on board and just go. You have no idea where you're going to end up. You have to have an idea of what you want to do, where you want to go, what is the journey and how do you get there? So without a vision, your company will just keep spinning wheels. So that vision is a very, very important part of your strategy. At Great Lakes, what's your, what's your mission? How did you develop it? And what's your vision for your company? Yeah, so I think for me, um, when I started the business and um, was thinking about this, I didn't really have one. Uh, I think if you ask any entrepreneur when they start, it's really about, I just want to survive. <laughs> Uh, is this going to even happen? Uh, but it became very apparent that um, as a leader of the organization, I did really have to think about the mission statement. And it became very clear to us that our mission is really how to create this economic and social impact to Ugandan coffee farmers. You know, That became the, the pure idea of where, what we wanted to achieve because we realized we're not producing a product. Uh, we're not just manufacturing something. We are relying on 22,000 farmers to provide us and to sell us their products and the coffee to be able to market it. So that became our mission. Uh, and that was something that, you know, we as a management and as a family, we set. Uh, but I do agree here with what uh, Vic shared as a story. I think the vision is something that um, you have to learn very fast how to bring your other team members into it. Uh, I think it's very challenging just to come up one day and say, guys, this is our mission, this is the vision, and this is how we're going to strategize to get it. And I think the problem with that is then you are just seen as the guy at the top who sets the rules, and that's how you go. Uh, and that is very challenging if you want to be a successful business and if you want to have longevity, right? So for us, the vision then became all about, okay, what do we do as an organization to service those customers. Uh, and that is something that has developed over time. Um, my team have a 
great input into how it goes. And it's also a reality that it changes, right? Um, suddenly, pre-COVID, your vision is X, right? Um, you're now trading into COVID. There are lockdowns. <clears throat> you can't move your product here and there. Your vision changes a little bit, but your mission never changes. So for me, I think um, that's my experience here, is that um, as a leader, set your mission so people know the mountain you're climbing, like Vic says, but um, the vision has to be built as a culture in the organization to get you there. And don't worry if you don't really know what it is yet, right? Um, it can evolve, right? Um, thank you. Both, both of you stress the importance of having a vision and what it can do for your company. Can you give us some more advice of how do you get your team members on board and not convince them, but make them also feel a part and believe in that mission and vision? So every day when they come to work, they know what they're doing and what they're working towards. Vikesh, you could. I, when I walk into my office, well, I'm actually walking to my office. The first thing I do is I walk to the warehouses and I meet, I say morning to my stores guys. And, you know, every bottle of wines or spirits now needs a URA stamp to the guys who are loading the guys who are delivering the the, the 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 product to the customer i spend pretty much like one hour of my the first hour of my day at work just in the stores i just don't walk up to the office and just appreciating them being grateful for them being there you know and having that personal relationship with everyone in your organization and communicating to them about the importance of their job, no matter how menial or skilled it is, it is important. And I try and connect, I try and help them to uh, make them inclusive on that. If without that, none of the other functions would exist. You know, you can bring in orders from the customers, but if the delivery is not done in the time, or the right products are not loaded in time, or the products are not stamped in time. So all these things are so operates as a team and helps achieve your mission and vision. So personal relationship with your staff and communicating this on a regular basis, make it inclusive. They need to understand it's, there's no point having a vision and mission just printed on the wall. But how is this, how does this relate to every person in the team? I think that's important. Thanks, sir. One of the key things I, I got from you right now is being connected, being connected to your staff. And I can relate to that a lot. However, whenever I start my day, I always start by walking through the hotel and I always start at the back of the hotel. The people at the back of your organization are rarely recognized for their contributions to your to your bigger picture. So I relate to what you're saying, and I think it's something that a lot more directors and managers need to do is get get on the ground, meet your people on a daily basis, and stay connected. Andres, what's what's your what's your opinion on this? Well, I think in my early days I failed miserably at that. Um, I was one of those entrepreneurs that thought, okay, I'm I'm going to build it and I'm going to do everything myself, right? And then um, I actually realized um, eventually that I was the problem, that um, I just wanted to manage every single uh, system that existed. Um, and then I had the challenge where I was looking at sort of my core team and I was not really seeing leaders come up. I was not seeing people take responsibility uh, for their positions. Um, and so uh, I started, a, it's a journey, it's an investment, it's time, it's building relationships where uh, I started to then focus on those soft skills, right? Um, just finding out more about uh, those individuals that work in the organization, you know, are they happy? What are they doing? Do they have goals? Do they have visions? Um, and so that started a process. Um, but ultimately, I think the, the turning point for me was um, I reached a point where the business was was growing very fast and we just didn't have structure um, and we didn't have people taking ownership 
of this system. Uh, and so I put a lot of effort in um, what kind of people do we want to recruit, you know, and this is maybe a good advice for young people who are looking to either set up a business or work in companies. Um, when you present yourself to an organization, you know, you might have the, the best CV, right? You might have finished in the best school and you might think that, you know, you hit everything. But in reality, some of our best performers have been people who've just come with a thirst of appetite to learn. And to me, that was the changing point. The moment I, I meet somebody in my organization who, who wants to learn and wants to grow, um, it opens up a completely different side of me where I'm willing to share uh, my learnings and values. And today I find myself in a situation where if I'm part of an organization or a family heritage that's over 90 years and I wanted to survive in the next 10, 20 years, um, I have to let go of a lot of these processes. I have to give the ownership to my team. And often as, a, as an entrepreneur, you're scared to give out your secrets. You're, uh, I, if I tell this employee or if I tell my staff member how to do this, uh, this is not going to look good, right? And you fear that. But trust me, you know, I've, I've been on both sides. The moment you let go, the moment you become transparent and you open up and you start to communicate clearly, magic will happen. And the, the great experience share that I have for this is, you know, there we are, you know, in March 2020, you know, we're about to have our best possible year, COVID hits, the lockdown hits, right? So the first thing is you're like, how am I going to save money? How am I going to save costs? So imagine having a conversation with staff, right? About sort of saving costs, potentially maybe um, everybody reducing their salaries and working from home and things as job security. Imagine having that conversation with your staff and team, whereby this is the first time you ever engage with them. Like, hi, listen, problem, COVID, out of a job, done. Uh, and so that's where you start to realize the benefits of really uh, building a culture, the organization, the communication. And those conversations make it much easier. And in fact, in my case, um, many of my staff actually solve many of the problems that we have. So thank you. The, the one main thing I got from your, from your comments was how important your corporate culture really is from the hiring process to the onboarding process. You need to find people that fit within your corporate culture who understand your mission and can grow with you to achieve your vision. For those, for those viewers at home, what are some steps they can take for them to better formulate their own mission and vision? Any suggestions on how they could do this themselves? Like you said, it's, it's not the first thing that entrepreneurs set out to. It's survival. It's how do you start the business? But this is a very important part about professionalizing ourselves. So any advice on that? Um, so what I've realized in the past is sometimes if you're just living and breathing your business every single day, you, you're very inward looking. You are not thinking about the outside. So one of the things for me that works well is uh, we have so many talented professions in Uganda, right? People who are really experts are taking your ideas and communicating them. So um, my experience here is that um, when you really want to define to get to those core values, maybe bring an external person uh, who can come in, who can interview you and he can understand your staff and together help you uh, formulate uh, that mission and that vision and what strategy. More than anything, really, um, I think what it does also, it, um, it shows the signs of vulnerability. To be able to open up your business to an external person and suddenly you turn around and you say, ah, my mission is to, to be number one, <laughs> to have the number one sales. And that person comes in and says, well, you're not even hitting those numbers. You're like number, number 77. You know, what are you talking about? Is this really your, your mission? So sometimes it's nice to have that reality check of an external person uh, coming in and help you formulate um, those key strategies and pillars for your business. And correct me if I'm wrong, but this doesn't even need to be a paid professional. It could be a friend. It could be someone in a competing relative business, maybe your neighboring business. I think getting advice and ideas from those around you that you trust is very, very powerful. 
And sometimes when people ask you those questions that you don't think of, it helps you to formulate your own mission and vision. Vikash, any, any ideas from you? For me, there were uh, two things and, you know, I don't manufacture anything or create anything in Uganda or as part of my business. So I try and understand what are my suppliers expectations of me and what are their values, mission and vision for you to be aligned. It almost kind of you automatically have to adapt to their vision and mission. You know, so what is it that what is it that these brands, what is it that the suppliers expect for me to do with these brands? And so there is that process. The second process for me was internal and was like, OK, this is my company. What do I stand for? And that is me as Vic, that this is what I want to do now. The vision and mission then becomes a process of aligning everybody in your team to what you stand for. And once you figure out what you stand for, and that becomes your mission and vision. Thanks. So that brings us to tip number two, which is make sure you formulate your, your mission, make sure you write it down, make sure you get your staff to understand it. I had done this one uh, exercise a few years ago. In order for my staff to pick up their salary, they had to recite the mission and vision. And through that process, every single one of my staff memorized those things. The next time when they came for their salary, I didn't ask them to recite. I asked them to explain it to me. Explain what is our vision, what is our mission, and why is it important to you? Just throw th through these little processes, it helped my entire team jump on board. So you've come up with your mission, you have your vision. What are some of the steps you have taken, the strategy that's helped you get closer and closer to your vision? Maybe I'll start with Vikesh. Thanks, um, Azar. So again, going back to the point I raised earlier is for, for growth and success for my business, what I've done is to learn from my suppliers. You know, the suppliers I represent have been in the world they have presence in every country in the world. What has worked there? You know, and what has not worked there? What are their successes and failures have been? And when you ask for it, your suppliers are more than happy to teach you or train your staff and invest in, in, in my company. So that's really helped me into, in terms of uh, strategy. And the second thing has been, to listen to your customers. What are they demanding? You know, to don't go, I don't go to my customers thinking, okay, what am I going to sell and how am I going to make? It's about how am I going to help my customers to make sure they have the best product offering for their customers? What is missing? You know, when you, when you go to any bar or restaurant, you'll see there's a wine and spirits list. How can I dominate that? How can I, offer products that are not there, almost working from the, the other way around, you know, so that's what's really helped me. Thanks. And for yourself? Um, I think for me, um, as a, as a business owner, it becomes quite crucial to really understand your, your research, your market, right? understanding your your competitors you know let's face it um you know most of us are in a marketplace here that if we come up with a great idea and we start it um it's very easy for somebody just to come ah this guy is successful i'm gonna i'm gonna copy him so for me i think the first thing is always just make sure that you understand the the market size right um you know and to me that is how it defines how your business is going to grow. Um, if your vision is to say, you know what, um, I'm going to set up um, a little kiosk or a little Rolex stand in this market, you know, which is in this specific uh, center, you know, I'm doing my maths and I can count that I can have 20 clients a day, 20 clients a day on 2,000 uh, shillings, that's 40,000, you know, times five, that's 200, 
times a month. And then you start to say, okay, from a market perspective and the research, you know, I have a, I have a small business that, that can work. Um, number two for me, I think, which is probably the most important thing to survive, um, is to focus on innovation. Um, I think often we get very comfortable. We have got this great idea. I'm going to do A, B, C, D, and you just set and decide that's what you're going to do. And then suddenly, um, as soon as things start to not look that great, you know, you, you panic and you lose that focus. Um, but if you are somebody who is innovative, who is creative, always try to think um, the step ahead, right? Always try to think ahead. So what I always do is um, I'm not necessarily always thinking about how am I going to get to reach that sales target? I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to reach that in six months time. So what can I do for the next five days, 10 days. So these are the small steps um, that you, you build up. So for me, I think those are the, the two key sharings and learnings about um, how I try to strategize my business. Thank you. So tip number four is have a strategy to succeed. You know, your, your mission is your purpose, your vision is your goal, and your strategy is the steps you take to reach that vision. Some of the summary of what, what we've said here is research, ask for advice, always be thinking, have a financial strategy and good cash management in place. Separate business cash from personal cash. There's a tendency for entrepreneurs to just pick up money from different boxes, but you need to separate those things. Your business cash is for you to grow and succeed. Your personal cash is what you use for, for your own personal expenses. Imitate things. If you see something that's successful outside of Uganda, try it here. If you see something working in our neighboring countries, also try it here. Now, apart from the backbone of our business, there's something inside of us as entrepreneurs that drive us to succeed. And one thing I've noticed is the passion that both of you have for your businesses. We've had multiple lunches and dinners together. And the reason I chose both of you for this topic was how passionately you speak of your business. Tell me about why you love your business and what is that passion that leads you to succeed? I'll start with Andy. Sure, thank you. Um, I think first um, I look at myself as a person and I love to entertain. I'm a very social person. I love to communicate. So my first thing really that motivates me is how can I be of service, right? Um, and that that's a great mindset to have um, because sometimes when you are you go into a business environment um it's not just about you selling a product to your client right it's not just you're sitting there and you're like uh, how much is this this is x pay you go you know think of the other soft things like hi good morning you know how are you how's your day those little soft things about just going beyond a little bit um those are the things that for me are almost priceless um because when a client has to choose between coming to your business and going to another business, those little soft skills, you know, about how you, your service was, it's going to go a long way, right? How often do we hear about, um, you know, just in our daily lives, right? Ah, you know, like I have my favorite Boda Boda guy. I have my favorite this, but why? It's because of the service. It's the way you, you interact with them. Um, the second thing for me is um, the people. Right. So I think you have to be realistic and we also have to be honest to ourselves. Right. Um, being an entrepreneur means that you can just be a one man team. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. You know, um, that is something that that's where at the level you started, that's where you go. But if you really want to define yourself as an entrepreneur who built a great organization, um, you really have to focus on people. Uh, all of us here in many ways, we just keep on going around the same topic, right? We talk about people. And for me, that's where I'm currently focusing a lot of my energy on. Uh, because I think if I can build the passion um, in my people, uh, in my team, and I can build a great level of service, um, I think it will buy me loyalty and it will buy me something that is priceless. Uh, and that is that when somebody has to choose between where they're going to sell their coffee, uh, I'd like to think that they would think, okay, 
I'm going to go to Great Lakes Coffee um, because of not just the price or the quality of these services. So, yeah. I, I can relate very much when you talk about people. The passion of your business is your people. At Fairway, we always train that customer service starts from the guards at the gate. You know, it's the first impression that a guest gets when they enter to the reception, to the room, to the conference or whatever it is. Every person they connect with is a touch point between that customer and your brand. So ensuring that everyone in your business shares that passion is a very powerful and important thing to growing your business. Vikesh, what is your passion? Why do you love your business? Good question, um, Azar. So I think it's, I believe it's a little bit similar to what Andreas just shared. And, you know, not, not so long ago, we, we had a company retreat and one of the facilitators asked my team, what has been the impact on their lives for working for my company? And I'd never, uh, I'd never asked any of my staff this question or uh, heard any of the answers before. So, you know, people shared that they'd been able to educate their kids and take them through schooling and university. Some staff shared that, um, you know, they were able to buy farmland. One guy said, you know, he was able to propose and get married to his longtime girlfriend. And I was touched, you know, I had tears in my eyes when you when when you listen to some of these stories and i thought wow you know like if i for me it's almost like the success of if i can measure the success of my company by the impact that it has on my staff then that's what it is going to be you know the other thing that i find passion is in creating experiences you know, today when you go to a party at a bar or a restaurant or a wedding, you know, it's all kind of fueled by alcohol, you know. And yeah, okay, I'm not promoting alcohol, but, you know, drink responsibly and make sure you're above 18. But it's almost that feeling that you see that people are able to enjoy those moments and um, have these um, experiences um with the product that you're offering them so and that kind of drives your passion you know to create more of those experiences i really enjoy that i've um it gives me great uh, sense of fulfillment thanks Azar. so in our industry alcohol is a very large part of creating memories and i believe that you're in the right country and in the right industry <laughs> People in Uganda like having fun. I mean, you go out on the weekends and you really see that people like to have a good time here. Um, and creating those memories, it's, it's a big part of our businesses. So I, I appreciate those words. You know, part about being an entrepreneur is not only enjoying the flexibility of the ups, but the, also the downs. The downs is what really tests your endurance as an entrepreneur and how you're able to get through those challenges. What keep you? What keeps you guys fighting? What keeps you motivated to succeed even during the downtimes, Andreas? Okay, so I think uh, reality check a little bit. I think um, you, when you set up a business or you decide to become an entrepreneur, um, I think you have to go in mentally ready and strong enough to realize that there will be challenges. Um, I think you know. When I look at most people, okay, we, we always, when we decide to invest our money and to start a business, we always, we don't have a bad idea. We sit on a piece of paper and we say, this is going to cost me 3000 I'm going to sell it to 12 I'm going to make my money, right? But we often don't really prepare ourselves mentally for those challenges. And the reality is um, where we live, uh, the market size we are, there are things that happen that you just can't control. Right? For example, you're a vendor. We're selling products um, on the side of the street. Now, as soon as it rains, what happens? Like Everybody just leaves. So suddenly, you've had three days of heavy rainfall, and you have no way of making an income. So to me, I think um, what I'm really focusing on right now is challenges will always be there. It's, um, it's now about my reaction, right? It's about 
uh, my attitude. So one of the first things right now is um, when there is a challenge, I take a big deep breath and I just kind of pause and say, is this also affecting other people? And that to me is always like a good leveler. Like if I'm struggling, if I'm being affected by this, there's somebody else. So that kind of brings things a little bit into perspective. Um, second, I think is you then always, as a good leader, or as a good business, you must always have a plan B, right? You must always have a contingency for those challenges. Um, and the reason I say that is I think some of the most successful businesses that I know have really risen and have had great success because when things were really tough, they were the ones who were the most innovative. They were the ones who were the most prepared. They were the ones who took advantage of that challenge and turned it into, into an opportunity. Um, so for me, I think that's good. Um, the other thing that's very important is as entrepreneur is, um, you know, obviously having a business, it's 24 hours. You're just living and breathing. That's all you do. So I think it's, um, it's good to try and find a balance, uh, try and find something else that you can escape to, right? Um, you want to go for a run or you want to listen to music or you just want to kind of just shut down your laptop, you know, and just go for a walk, go and see your mom, go and see the kids. And I think it's finding those, those balances because let's face it, um, you cannot be operating in the market that we are in today and not have challenges a potentially a daily challenge. Um, but your reactions and how you prepare for those, I think is what will really define your business um, if it's going to be successful uh, and if it's going to have longe longevity. Thank you. Vikash, what are the, some of the things that keep you determined to succeed? When you're faced with a challenge, what are the steps you take in order to overcome that challenge? So for me, the way I look at my journey as an entrepreneur, first of all, entrepreneurship is about taking risk. You know, so in my business, I've found that pretty much like four out of 10 products that I try fail. You know, I recently um, thought there would be a good idea to get into the pet food business. I failed miserably. Okay, I could afford to fail miserably, because I know I kind of have my core business, but um, I believed in an idea, but I failed. So, but it could have worked. When I got into the wines and spirits business, I had no idea what I was getting into, but the opportunity existed. And I said, yes. And I said, I'll figure out how to do it. So being an entrepreneur, embrace risk, embrace failure and successes, your highs and your lows. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. But if you don't try it, you'll never know. So, and, and you know, I've accepted one thing that you're never in control of everything. You know, yesterday I was in a EO webinar where the, the keynote speaker said, you know, risk is what you don't see. Risk is what is left over after you've thought of everything, right? So, you know, this whole idea that you're in control of everything is an illusion. You never were, you never are, and you never will be. So if you're never in control, what do you do, right? You control the experience of your journey, of your entrepreneurship journey, of your business. So, you know, be positive, enjoy the journey, right? because the, the successes and the failures are part of it. They run parallel. So embrace it and enjoy it. I think enjoyment comes in the highs. It's hard to enjoy it in the lows, <laughs> but, but you're right. I, I think having a balance between work life, personal life, as Andy said, um, and thinking of the risks that you haven't thought of yet or preparing for those risks is very important. There's two things that have come up in both your conversations. One is the challenges through COVID and one is dealing with, with failure. Let's focus on the challenges we've been facing at COVID. If I look at my industry as a hotel, I mean, airports were closed, uh, lockdown came all of a sudden. It was our, our hindsight, the thought process we had before lockdown that helped us kind of make it through. 
What are some of the challenges you guys face in your business in COVID and how did you overcome those challenges? Start with Andreas. Sure. Um, so one of the first positive parts about COVID is um, everybody went home all over the world and people wanted to drink coffee um, and there wasn't enough coffee. So the market prices went, went quite high. And so today, uh, when I look at sort of uh, our farmers across Uganda, um, they're probably having one of their best ever uh, years in terms of the prices they're getting for their product. Uh, in some cases, farmers are making almost 40, 50 percent uh, higher than they did three, four years ago, which is which is great. You know, they uh, when you're in agriculture and you're a farmer, you know, it's a bit of a flow. And most of the times it's a lower flow. So when the tide is up, you take advantage. So um, COVID has been good for that, for my sector in the coffee prices. Uh, farmers are earning uh, more money. Uh, those who focus on increasing their yields and production, having a great time. Uh, unfortunately, the, the biggest uh, impact in my business or the challenge of COVID uh, is Uganda is a uh, landlocked country. And as we know, um, for us to export all our coffees, you know, we have to use trucks, containers, take them to a port in Kenya, and then they go all over the world. And if you follow the news, you know, um, sea freight costs all over the world, in some cases, are five times higher. So while we have this amazing opportunity to maximize our sales and our income, in reality, something beyond our control, such as this logistics bottleneck, is preventing us from exporting all this coffee that we're able to produce uh, and to sell. Um, so that is, for me, one of the biggest challenges. And at the same time, also, we um, we faced um, logistical challenges within the country. You know, um, I have to say, I think I was very impressed how fast uh, our government reacted um, with the lockdowns and ensuring that pockets of the communities were all isolated. Um, it was a problem for the first three, four months for us. You know, you couldn't travel from uh, Kapchora, you know, to take your coffee all the way back to Kampala. There were border restrictions. But the other great part about being an entrepreneur and being in this market, communicate with people, have conversations, you know, speak to the authorities. And very fast um, as a community and as a sector, you know, we did engage with the right people. And we found solutions. But overall, I think for us, the biggest impact of COVID is the logistics. Um, you know, exporting our goods out of Uganda, when let's face it, our economy is, is not doing really well right now. And there's very few items coming into the country. Um, so yeah, it's one of those challenges. Thank you. One key point I picked up was the ability to be agile and adapt yourself very quickly to situations. As entrepreneurs, you always have to be thinking, you always have to be adaptable. You never know what's going to come your way. So that forward thinking, I think, is what also keeps us alive. Vikash, in your business during COVID, I, I assume you also faced very many challenges. How did you overcome those? Of course, uh, Azar. So, you know, while Andreas has a problem of getting his product out, I have a problem of getting product in. So during the pandemic, Uganda being a landlocked country, it's a big challenge to get products from Mexico and Europe and South Africa. You know, so where the lead times were like 30 days, and then now 60 and 90 days. So you need to stock a lot more, it means you need a lot more investment. You need a lot more capital. So you know, what has really helped me, and again, coming back to a point Andy made, was communication. So a key thing for me is keep your suppliers informed. Involve them. They're your partners. Without them, you do not exist. If I can't get a product from my customers, I have nothing to sell. I mean, from my suppliers. So the point I'm making is, you know, they're, they're facing similar problems. If you've had a good relationship you know, they're going to understand, right? Because like South Africa um, stopped all sales, uh, alcohol sales within the country. And for a moment, they even stopped um, exports of wines. So 
my suppliers were able to afford me uh, longer credit terms and a, and, a, and, a, and a better price because they had surplus stocks in in the country. So involve, don't hide, you know, involve your suppliers. Uh, the second thing is, you know, we we are a leading distribution company, but we are small. You know, for me to have a management meeting and to change strategy takes a day. It takes a couple of hours. We have a new strategy. And within a couple of hours or the next day, we adapt that and we go. So be lean, you know, be agile. You know, so the third thing is, you know, I, I come I come to the office, you know, during the lockdown, I would walk it or take my little scooter or ride a bicycle to the office. And, you know, you, you, you don't, I mean, you know, you face with times when you don't even know how to get to the office. So you get there, you meet staff and they're all asking questions, you know, like, boss, what do we do? How do we do this? How are we going to sell? How are we going to deliver? You know, bars are closed, nightclubs are closed. We still have a curfew. This has a huge impact on your business. So what I've learned is be vulnerable. As the owner of the company, it's okay to say, you know what, I actually don't know. I don't know what the solution is. I was not trained for this. I've not faced such problems before. So I actually don't know. Why don't we sit and we figure these things out together? So again, include your team and develop a strategy together. So, you know, for us, for example, from, you know, rather than selling to bars and hotels, which would, you know, we, we, we developed a strategy. How are we going to focus on B2C, you know, from the business to a consumer point of view? How do we make the product available to people's homes? How do we focus more on the off trade, which are the supermarkets and the shops? So be lean, be fast and be ready to adapt. And you don't always have the answers. Figure it out. It's a journey, right? So some takeaways, communication, communicate to your customers, to your team. I think that's what really helps businesses get through. Secondly, relationship management. I relate to that very much for me in my business. All of a sudden money stopped coming in. People weren't going to the office. People couldn't pay up their bills. So the relationship we had with customers, sorry, with um, suppliers giving us 90 days, 120 days credit is what really helped us. I'd like to publicly thank all of our suppliers who have been supporting. Please continue to. Um, and thirdly, the teamwork. You're right. I, I had the same issue. I didn't know the answers of how to get out of the COVID situation. And we did brainstorming sessions. We put pieces of paper up on the wall. I'd bring in managers, supervisors, even juniors and said, hey, this is a problem we have. How do we solve it? So involve your teams. Be transparent. Working together, you can get yourself out of certain challenges. A word that came up a few times is failure. Now, nobody wants to fail, but the journey of failing and being reborn through that journey is something quite powerful. You had said that once you focused on your core business, you were then able to go off on different things. And that's also extremely powerful. There's a tendency for entrepreneurs, especially in Uganda, to want to do multiple businesses. They're doing this, they're doing that, they want to do this. But without focusing on your core business first, strengthening that, and then trying different things, if something doesn't work, you have nothing to fall back on. I myself went on this journey a few years ago. I wanted to get into the pillow business. So I opened up a small pillow place in Taxi Park, 7,000 shillings a dish. And my thought process was, let's provide a high quality pillow and takeaway packages. But I didn't do my market research. Even that 2,000 shilling increment in price from what is normally 5,000 was enough to deter away customers and I failed. But I learned through that process that, hey, do surveys, go on the ground, ask people what they want before you invest in their business. Can either of you share a story of where you tried something, failed, and what you learned from it? So people in the audience can also learn from that journey. If I may go, as so going back to the point I raised earlier was like the pet food business. So I'm like, okay, I have a route to market, going to supermarkets and shops, selling wines and spirits. On the back of that, what else can I sell? You know, how can I, what, how can I take advantage and maximize the route to market that I've created to sell other products and, and scale my business? 
that's what I thought. But what I failed to understand was that when you bring in a new product, it needs hard work to sell. Were my sales reps, was my team ready for that? Mm, no. You know, was I, um, is, was it a brand that was known? Yes. Was it a, br I, I sell wines and spirits, which like spirits, as you know, doesn't really have an expiry date. It has a manufacturing date. But the, the food product that I brought, the pet food range, has an expiry date. And the moment the container landed, the time started clicking. You know, the clock started clicking. So it was like, sell, 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 sell. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And then other people have brought in the same product. So, like, you know, I it, it failed because I thought, like, I had a successful business, a successful route to market. But there were so many things that I did not consider. So I got out of it and focused on my core business and said, you know what? Okay, fine. I'm going to stick to what I know. So focus on your core business, I can say that's it. Yeah. And how about yourself? Any experiences of failure that we can share and learn from? Sure. Um, I failed a lot. <laughs> um, when maybe about seven, eight years ago, when we were trying to define how we we really want to work with farmers. Um, how do we really impact their lives? Um, you know, at that time, the idea was you, you just go and you work with farmers in cooperatives. Um, and we did that. And I realized very fast that while cooperatives or unions, you know, was a great way to build community, um, it really lacked uh, transparency. It was very difficult. Um, it became very obvious that um, when we were paying X price to the cooperative or the union, um, the farmers were actually receiving um, less money. And you could see farmers tell us, they were telling us these stories, but we were just so stuck in our ways that we're, no, 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 it's gotta be through, through the cooperatives and so on. Um, eventually, after a couple of years, um, we realized we were losing so much money. Um, the coffee quality was not great. Um, we were not the volumes that we were being promised. So that failure um, actually prompted us to really think of a different strategy. And it also became um, a big turning place in my business when I realized that one of the big failures here was lack of transparency. So very fast, um, we decided to build uh, a digital app, a digital traceability platform, whereby it would no longer be possible for you to cheat the farmer. And at first, I was like, this is crazy. I know nothing about technology. I know nothing about apps. What am I even going to do? I just know about coffee. But it was amazing because, again, it was an amazing opportunity. In Uganda, I found a team of developers uh, self-taught coders, you know, and we started this journey uh, of how do we digitalize our supply chains from identifying the farmer, giving them a unique system generated ID to even going as far as using fingerprint technology to say, well, if you bought the coffee from John, you know, how much did you pay him? I paid him so much. Please make sure John has his fingerprint to confirm. And that failure of those three years of not understanding the needs of farmers and just focusing on what the status quo was doing. And the moment we changed that and it created a unique product. And today I can safely say that this digital platform is one of the most unique products that I have. It's a unique selling point. It distinguishes me from my competitors. Um, and I'm very proud of that because there's no way that would have happened without those three years of failure, of not understanding what my market was really doing. So, yeah, I think failure is part of the journey, um, but I think it's how you react to it that can really take your business to the next level. Uh, and it also makes it more difficult for your competitors to compete, right? Because they will also fail at some point with the same mistakes that you've done, but you've already moved on. So that brings us to tip number five. Let the passion and your why drive you through challenges. Tip number six, 
don't fear failure. If you fail, learn from it. If others fail, ask them questions. Learn from their failures so you don't make the same mistakes in your own. Now, I'd like to talk about the life of an entrepreneur. I always believe that those in the corporate world have it a little bit different than those with an entrepreneurial mind. For myself, I can't enjoy going to a restaurant. I'm going to a restaurant to eat with my friends, but I'm looking at the plates they're using, the service, did they serve me from the right or the left? I walk into a hotel and I'm looking at their uniforms, how am I greeted? My wife always tells me, you know, Lazar, you need to switch off. You need to just enjoy your life, relax, have a steak and, and enjoy. But as an entrepreneur, I find that your mind is always clicking. It's always moving. What's it like for you? How has your entrepreneurial journey been? And how do you switch it off? I can totally relate to you. As... <laughs> so, you know, if I go to any bar or restaurant, when I go out for dinners with friends and family, they're like, Vic, stop it. And they know what they're asking. They won't even say, what, what, what am I doing? But they're like, Vic, stop it. Vic, just... Can you focus on being present here? Because I'm physically present there, but mentally my awareness is what's everyone drinking? What's the waiter pouring? What's behind the bar? You know, what's the display looking like? What's on the menu? You know, what price are they selling? You know, so as an entrepreneur, it's almost like you never switch off. And like you said, it's very, very hard to do that. It's a mindset. It's almost like you were born that way. You know, and that's your life. You know, you, you don't know any other way. You know, I, there is, you know, we work from Monday to Sundays, Christmas now. Customers want orders, you know. We're working from 8 in the morning till 7 in the evening. So there is no time, you know. Uh, you've got to take that ownership. You get into it, you know. So, and like Andy said, it's very, very hard to switch off. So... It's a mindset, you know, you go to put in the hard work, you go to have that discipline. But on the other hand, I think it's also so important to invest in yourself. Like I said earlier, you do not know the answers. To inspire the team, you pretty much need a certain skill set. You always have to kind of build new, develop new thoughts. So how do you do that? So, you know, joining something like EO, and the learning experiences that EO offers, going to international, traveling the world, see what people are consuming, get new ideas, visit trade fairs. You know, so I pick up a lot of ideas by traveling and uh, doing trainings, personal and professional trainings, where I can then suck it all in and then help my team um, pass it on to my team. So. Investing in yourself, you know, the oxygen that you need to survive, that's also important. So invest in yourself. You know, you are important. You've got to be a bit selfish. So don't ignore yourself. Or organizations such as BNI and EO, they put you, they surround you with people like you with a similar mindset. When we talk about, you know, ask for opinions, find people who fail, it's organizations such as EO where you can find those forums. For any of you at home that are interested in joining EO, just Google Entrepreneurs Organization Uganda, find out more about it, and if you're interested, please do apply. Andreas, tell us a bit about your entrepreneurial journey and what are some takeaways that you've gained from being part of EO? Look, in the first place, um, just to share is, uh, I don't think being a business owner and entrepreneur is for everybody. Um, I think you really have to be a very unique person. You have to have a mind, a mindset, a work ethic, and an attitude, uh, not to be average. Um, and you know, I sometimes also appreciate people who are honest enough to say, "No, no, no, no." Um, you know, Apollo was mentioning. You know, he's not necessarily wants to get into a business, but he works for an SSF. This is what he does. So I think um, understanding your limitations and your boundaries. I think that's quite key. Um, my EO journey, um, it's very simple. Um, being an entrepreneur is very lonely. Um, you are in this bubble. Um, you're almost like in your own little secretive world. And you almost are scared to, 
to share with other people, right? Your failures, your successes. You don't want people to to know why is this guy successful, not successful. So it became a very lonely place. Um, and that was draining. So um, what I gained from EO was like the realization that there are actually lots of people just like me who are also in a lonely place and are looking for a platform where um, they can be vulnerable, right? Um, and that takes me to my second point is that, you know, EO is, is not all about just your business and how you grow your business and how you network. It provides that. But more than anything, it is, it is a platform where you can be vulnerable. And to me, that has been something that I've really gained in the last couple of years. And I'll tell you why. You know, um, I'm a big believer that um, knowledge, right, is quite powerful. And sharing knowledge is even more powerful. Um, and I feel like um, I'm in the stage of my life where um, I am a little bit more transparent. Um, I do feel that if I've had a bad experience, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak about it, right? I'm not going to hide it. Um, and if somebody has had a great experience, I want to learn from that, right? It's about these moments and experiences. So for me, EO has been a great space to meet like-minded people, uh, to share my thoughts in a non-judgmental, uh, in a vulnerable way. And what I get out of it is a bit like what Vic says, you know, the, um, the personal growth afterwards is amazing. You will start to see how your business is, uh, some of those key things that you learned in those conversations with other people, you're going to apply them in your business. Um, and I'm very proud of that. And I'm actually also incredibly proud of this initiative that you've taken to openly speak about uh, the challenges about entrepreneurship, the pitfalls, because I do feel that, you know, um, we have such a vibrant, um, young base that is looking to be creative, that is you looking to be innovative. Uh, and I'm really grateful for EO to, and NSSF to put on these events where we can share these stories in a really nice, uh, open way without feeling that, oh, am I going to be telling too much information and secrets? So, yeah. Can I share something? Um, <clears throat> so, you know, when I look at the EO values here, it says, you know, think big, be bold, together we grow. So what comes to my mind when you ask about the EO journey is, first of all, it breaks down into two for me. So what is personal and professional? So personally, you know, you always had this dream, you know, you have your bucket list. I want to climb mountains. So with my EO buddies, I climbed four mountains in the past two years. You know, I always wanted to go on a long open road journey. So with Andreas, I think it was last month that we did a thousand kilometer bike ride with over a period of three nights and four days. You know, something that I always wanted to do, but I didn't know who to do it with. You know, and then you come, you 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 know, you you establish you you form these like minded people and you're like, Yeah, let's do it. Be bold, let's do it. We did a bungee jump in Dubai in October. Uh, with our Dubai, with our EO um, group, which which attended the the conference there, again, experiences I wanted to do, never had the chance, but now I'm doing it with my EO uh, members. Professionally, I've entered into collaborations and partnerships in relation to my business, which has really helped me to grow. Uh, whether it's from the supplier end or from the consumer end. And the biggest learning is, you know, together we grow. That's the forum. That's what comes. The forum is where we meet our forum buddies once a month. And that peer-to-peer -peer learning through, as Andrea said, through confidentiality, trust, respect, and vulnerability is amazing because how better to learn from no better than somebody else who's experiencing the same problems. So that's been very powerful and transformational, transformational for me. So two large takeaways from this discussion is one, surround yourself with people like you, people who are driven, people who want to grow other entrepreneurs and 
BNI, EO, these are some of those organizations that can give you that. On the other side, sharing knowledge. Knowledge is very, very powerful. Someone can take your house, they can take your car, but knowledge is that passport that remains with you for life. It will help you grow, it will help you get out of challenges. And sharing knowledge is a very noble thing. Even if you don't have an education, if you haven't gone to school, everything's online. Google things you don't know. Ask people for questions you have. And that brings us to our final closing part of the session, which is the answers and questions from the audience. We have one of our viewers on YouTube who is asking yourself, how do you keep your employees passionate? How do you motivate your staff? Inclusion. You know, that's the first thing. Make them part of the businesses. I almost have a mindset with my employees that, you know, you don't work for this company. Don't come to the company because you're ticking a box and you have to come nine to five. Come because there is, you know, the, the, the why as an entrepreneur, why I help them to find why is there as an employee. You know, I almost get them to think like an entrepreneur. This company is your company. There's a warehouse there full of stock, go out and sell it. And they become part of the reward. You know, I am very quite, um, I'm always quite happy to share the rewards with bonuses and uh, commissions with my, with my sales team. And I, I tell them that, you know what, I'm not here to motivate you, right? I'm, what I need from them is to find their own discipline, right? You work for yourself. Go out and do what you're supposed to do. Do the right things, right? Take the right steps when you go and see the customer, build relationships, make sure the products are there, make sure the visibility is there. You know, do the right things over and over again. Get that discipline going, right? And make them part of the company. Share. Don't be selfish. Thank you. Andreas, there's a lot of conversation about coffee. There's a member of ours from the Western region. People in the Western region have not embraced the value of coffee, and they don't know that coffee is amongst the major cash crops in Uganda and its value. What is your take on this matter? And how can Great Lakes bring more awareness to people in the coffee industry and bring more farmers to work with yourself and your company? Well, whoever asked that question, I just want to declare that um, I think uh, Western Uganda, the Ranzori Mountains, produces some of the best, best coffees in Uganda. So, uh, and actually, I think um, this is something that um, my sector needs to really embrace, right? Um, for many, they just seem to think that um, when it comes to Arabica coffees, it's just grown in Mount Algon, Mount Algon, Mount Algon, you know, in Eastern Uganda. But there are amazing um, opportunities to grow coffees in other parts of Uganda. Um, to ask specifically that question, um, Great Lakes is one of the largest uh, investors in Western Uganda, uh, in Kasese. So um, we're very active there. Um, he just needs to go to Great Lakes um, website. He can get our information from there. Uh, but crucially, if he just goes through Kasese town and he asked for Great Lakes coffee, I think he'll have some help. But there's a key point here. Um, and this is something that I feel is crucial to uh, educating people on coffee. And I feel that for many people, they don't even drink coffee. Most people were like, oh, we just grew this product, right? And I think that's where the, the mind change uh, needs to happen. So you know, when you go around Uganda, you see people, they spent all this time, they've grown their coffee, and then the next thing they do is they just throw it on the ground and it just picks up dust, soil, you know, all the things. And I always say to people, like, would you want to drink that? Would that represent something of quality? Um, so for me, I think that's the key here. I think uh, the people who want to get in coffee and who want to get into uh, supplying good coffee, I think the first thing is just go out there and just start drink a cup of coffee, right? Compare and see, okay, why is this coffee different to that coffee? And then you yourself very fast, once you drink it, you will see the answer there. You will realize when you ask the next question, well, wh who grew this coffee and how 
versus who grew this coffee and how, then you realize that clearly the person who's growing the better quality coffee is able to earn a bit more money. Douglas Bibita is asking, as an entrepreneur, you seem to be specialized in particular areas. What is your take on diversification into other businesses? Are there any dangers associated with the diversification? Um, I think it's, you've got to be careful, right? Um, I think in, in your early formative years of setting up a business, I think you've got to focus on one. I think it's very important that you establish the base, right? Because let's face it, as an entrepreneur, you're also taking a risk, not just for you, but for your family members, right? You didn't quit your job just to be selfish for yourself. Whatever you're going to do and set up has got to be able to sustain your family. So I think it's very important that you, you first focus on that one business. Um, and the reason being, I think if you're really passionate, right, you will focus on that business. Um, the moment you start thinking that from that early stage to diversify, I think then you haven't really quite figured out what is your passion and um, to go on. So I think in the early stages, you focus. Um, as your business grows, um, as your cash flow grows, you will find amazing new opportunities. And I think at that time, then you have the opportunity to diversify, right? But never forget, always have one core business. That is the one business that sustains you. Rain, sunshine, markets, chains, that's the one goal. If you then have the additional capacity, then to diversify, I think, is a, is a great strategy. And it's how potentially how you go from just um, being a very basic business owner to really creating a generational wealth, as they call it, right? To be able to provide for your kids and then their grandkids and so on. So I think it's the timing of the different diversification is key. I, I please <laughs> can answer. Can I add something to that? Hazar? So my, my thought on that is, you know, as an entrepreneur, you time is finite, right? So you, do, you only have 24 hours, you know, your where you spend your time is where your awareness goes and where your awareness goes is where your focus goes and where you focus on is where you eventually end up being successful. So do I have the time, you know, first of all, as an entrepreneur to have multiple businesses, you know, if I have a team that is managing, okay, fine. That relieves me of certain time. And then I can maybe do other businesses, but while I don't have that, I'm not going to look at it. I, I personally, I'm at a level where I have no time. So I'm not looking at any diversification. Second of all, what I believe in, in an, as an entrepreneur is, you know, three things go to make, uh, to make you successful it's knowledge, passion, and action, right? So when you think about diversification, do I, do I know the know-how, right? You can always learn that, but then do I have the passion for that or am I doing it just for the money, you know? And the third thing is action. Right, this you can you can make fancy business plans, right, and they look very profitable. Okay, fine, and I'm very passionate about it. But am I going to do something about it? And to do something about it, do I have even have the time to do it? Right. So I think you've got to consider these three elements before you think about diversification. I love that diversification, passion, and action. Those are some great great answers. I'd also like to recommend that those of you who are looking at diversifying your business, first try looking at those businesses that are complementary to your business. For example, if you have a small restaurant, look at the takeaway business, look at deliveries to other corporates. If you're in, for example, hardware, people come for you for hardware because they want to build something, to do something. Try to formulate a team of tradespeople around you. You can link up tradespeople with people who are constructing, take a finder's fee, so always look at those diversifications that are somehow complementary before going into something that's completely different. Another question from online, Elata Filifa is asking, as entrepreneurs, how do you sensitize your employees about savings? NSSF. 
<laughs> <laughs> That's what they're for. You know, just as we walked in and I was telling us, hmm, I've got some good money here. And, you know, I think the midterm or whatever was agreed, I think, yeah, that would be a good one uh, when I hit that bracket. But like NSSF, uh, you know, the IPO for the MTN, you know, there are a couple of companies that offer uh, savings through uh, government securities. So, you know, I, I, I certainly believe that, um, you know, my, my principle on saving is the law of compounding. Honestly, when, you, when, you, when we think about the world's richest man like Warren Buffet, he accumulated 60% of his wealth when he was like 60 years old, after he was 60 years old. Why? Because he had invested in shares, in equity, in stocks, when he was like 15, when he was 20. And those stocks did not appreciate much in value until now, after like 40 years later, right? So you've got to be patient and believe in the law of compounding, right? So we're, we're lucky to be living in Uganda where the interest rates are pretty good on your savings. So take make, make use of that. When you're looking at saving and investing, I always tell my staff that you're coming to work for me and that's not the end. I don't want to see you working with me for 15, 20 years, leaving and then having nothing to go to. Always have a plan. Whether you're a cleaner in an office building, whether you're working in admin, have a plan of what you want to do when you receive your NSSF money. And every month, even if you can only save 5,000 shillings a month, put something away in your account in case of bad days, in case you see an opportunity, you will have that little egg of money there that you can then invest and grow. Those of you who are in jobs, I highly recommend you contribute to NSSF, but you also have a plan for what you want to do when you receive your NSSF money. Another question that's come in is, how do you attract the right talent to your organization? How do you retain them? And how do you groom them to grow your organization? Um, well, I think probably from my business side, we, we don't hire as many people perhaps as some of your businesses where you're in sales or other things. Um, the way that I'm approaching right now, um, recruitment is first and foremost is, uh, within my sector, you know, I just always make it my priority to understand who's who in the industry, right? Um, build a good network. And I always find that the moment I have a good network around me, uh, I can send a WhatsApp message and say, I'm looking for X. And those personal recommendations uh, for me are very valuable, right? So my first take is how I look at my network. I go into that and then I see. Um, how, to, how to retain staff, I think that's a, that's a big challenge. Um, and, and I think it's also it's both a challenge and it's an opportunity. Um, and here's why. You see, when somebody joins a, an organization, right, um, it's very important to understand at what stage of their life are they at, right? Um, are they, and just be honest to your employees sometimes, you know, when you go for an interview, uh, when they ask you the question, you know, what's, what's your goal here? A bit like what you said. When somebody looks at me and says, ah, this is for me, it's for life, you know? I'm committed. I'm like, ah, it's just, it's a red mark. You know, sometimes it's okay to have employees who are like, yep, I'm coming because I feel this is the best place for me to learn and to grow. And then I'm ready to move on. Right. So that meets, um, great levels of expectations. Um, the other tool for me that I like to use is, you know, I always ask the question to people and I say, okay, so you've applied for this job, you know, how much would you like to earn? And they look at me as if I've asked them the most difficult question on earth. And I'm like, what do you mean how much? Well, whatever you pay me. And I'm like, really? Whatever I pay you? The, what is your, your motivation? This is your opportunity. Speak your mind, right? Say, what is it that you think you deserve to earn? And, you know, I look back at some of my experience, some of my most successful employees is exactly that. Um, I had a figure in mind, right? Um, they came up and I said, how much would you like to earn? 
And the figure they came up with was three times what I had, I was thinking. But I was so impressed because then this individual went and said, well, the reason I want to earn these three times is because of this. And on a piece of paper, he wrote his expenses, his dreams, his savings, and the things. And I was so impressed that he had thought about this. And then in return, I went back to him. I said, sure, I will give you that number. But here's my condition, right? And I'm going to draw a box. And I expect this, 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 this from you. And in principle, that was the interview, right? And this person has gone on to, to be a great asset in my team, right? And he hit every single one of those things. So um, I think it's all about just making sure that uh, when you are looking to go for a job, right, just be honest to people. And the third one, sorry, I have to say this, um, and I'm very passionate about this, is references. You see, we take it for granted. We just write a reference, my school teacher, and do this. Now, my question is, how many of the employees ever called those references? You know, check them out. If somebody is so impressive, like, why did they leave that other job? If, why, what is the reason for coming back? So I think we have to be, as a business community, we really have to start using each other as a, as a referencing point, you know? Um, so, yeah, so that's my, my take. So the next time any of you are going for an interview with Andy, always ask for five times because then you know you can negotiate your way way down. But what you said ha ha makes a lot of sense. You know, as an individual, you have to understand what is your value. And even if your employer is paying you slightly less right now or when you're negotiating, say, look, I believe I can bring you this. If I bring you this, I'd like to at least be earning that. Help your employer find a way to increase your salary by seeing your value. It's a negotiation. I always tell my HR manager that our customers are not only the people that walk through the door to spend money. Our suppliers, our staff, you are also our customers. We also have to make sure you are happy, you are motivated, and you see growth in your career. Otherwise, you wouldn't give me your all. Is there anything? Sure, sir. So, you know, I'm looking at the question in two ways. One is uh, recruitment. So I have a principle. I almost hired nobody from my competitors. You know, so some of my competitors, and when I've tried to work with their with their staff, they come with a very fixed mindset and a certain way of doing things. And my competitor may be big or small, but then how do they fit into my organization? You know, so there becomes a bit of a misalignment there. So it's better to start from the scratch. Like I've had employees working with me for like the past 15 years and some since I found the found uh, started the distribution company, they've been there from the day one. So there it's all it's easier to align people to your values and your mission and vision when they come with an open kind of uh, open mind. The second thing comes about retention. And you know, I believe in a principle which I learned from a guy called Simon Sinek. You know, he's very popular. He's an American guy on YouTube and stuff. And he said, you know, be, treat your employees like your family. You know, we, we as, us as entrepreneurs, we talked about failures and successes. So why don't we allow our employees to fail? If we're allowed to fail as business owners, why can't our employees have failures as well. And the way Simon Sinek put it is like, if you have a son or a daughter, he goes to school, he fails, right? He came with 40% instead of 80%. He got a C grade instead of an A grade. What are you going to do? Are you going to kick him out of the house? <laughs> right? He's your son. Okay. So talk to him, understand, okay, maybe he may not be good in maths, but he may be good in sports, in football. You know, he may be a good swimmer. So how do you pick, you know, observe your employees. What are the strengths and weaknesses, right? If he keeps on failing at this, okay, fine. But what are his successes? Can you take those talents and build on that and use them in your company and get the best out of that guy? So be fair, you know, treat your, treat your employees as your, as your family members, you know, allow them, be them for them. You know, I think... When it comes you with our employees, they only know they only want to know one thing. Are you there for them? 
you know, are you there for them? When something happens, are you there for them? And I think that's a motivation uh, enough for employees to be retained. I, I like that a lot. It actually reminds me of something that happened to me last night. I was on site at around 10 p.m. and um, one of our cleaners came up to me and was just pointing at a beam and said, you know, this beam is could have been like this. And I'm like, you're a cleaner. How do you know about the beam? And he said, I have an engineering background. So I said, you studied engineering, yet you're a cleaner at Fairway. And he's like, yeah, there were no opportunities to me. And I was like, how do you like being a cleaner? And he's like, I don't love it, but I do it with passion. And I'd always seen this, this guy who puts, it in, puts a lot of work into his job. And that just shows you that sometimes we hire people not really knowing their true value. And as an employer, we have a moral responsibility to be there for our staff. If someone is not performing, you don't just fire them. You understand why they're not performing. What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? Just like Vic said, you wouldn't kick out your son just for failing a grade. And it should be the same way for your staff. You can't just fire someone for not, for not maybe meeting your expectations straight away. First, understand the reason, train them, give them the opportunity for them to surprise you. We have a lot of questions coming in. We'll only take a few more. Uh, we have one from Peter Ngungu. According to the poll conducted earlier, most people have not started their entrepreneurial journey. What advice would you give to them? And do you think that entrepreneurship is a skill that can be taught or is it something you have to be born with? Uh, okay, that's a great question. Um, I think first, um, I think it's something that you kind of have in you. Uh, I definitely think that it's, you've got to have that ability to be a multitasker, great communica communicator, um, just have that charm and charisma. Uh, if I, the way I look at young entrepreneurs in Uganda, or young people want to get it, uh, I think this is a great time to try your idea in Uganda. There are a lot of NGOs, a lot of development agencies, as are you talked about the group that um, you have founded, where there are now so many platforms where young people can go and pitch an idea, uh, get their idea revised. And there's lots of people like us who are willing to give up their time to mentor. So my advice is this is the perfect time um, for you if you have a good idea, look up these development agencies, um, these entrepreneurial programs, youth employment. It's a big focus, you know. You'll regret if you, if you don't do it. Yeah. Well, I was born into a family of, uh, fortunate to be born into a family of entrepreneurs. So it's almost like that's the only thing you know. You know, you don't know the other side. So, you know, coming from that, from the moment you're born, you know, I was working in my dad's shop. So I understood how to, how, uh, how stock keeping and warehousing works. You know, my dad had a, had a transport company. So you understand how logistics and freight works, you know. So for me, I was maybe privileged and fortunate to just born into that. And that gave me, and enough experience um, um, to be an entrepreneur um, by myself, but um, and and maybe that's why I don't believe that I needed a degree or anything to validate what I knew, what I already knew. You know? So uh, I also believe the Western um, education system and stuff. Yes, it works, but it may not be applicable to Uganda. So. Yeah, I think you just need to get into it. Thanks. I think what you just said was very powerful. I feel like a lot of people believe they can't succeed if they don't have the right education. Yet you yourself said you haven't finished your degree and you're succeeding in business. Education is all around you. It's up to you to access it, to ask for it, to Google it, and to, to absorb it if you're ready for it. And when you're starting a business, you need to have that confidence do the research, ask questions, get advice, but have confidence when you go into any business. We have a question here from Sarah Apua. There are a lot of people out there who have great ideas, but lack the capital to make it happen. As great entrepreneurs in this country, what would you advise them regarding how to get capital to start their businesses? Oh, um, I, I really feel for that question uh, because I, I do think there's a gap in this country. Um, I do feel that 
a lot of the money that is put in place to help entrepreneurs is almost unattainable for the entrepreneurs. You know, uh, these institutions, they put a list of all the requirements. You need uh, three years trading history. You need this, you need that. Well, wait a minute. It's my first time doing business. So I definitely think that we are failing entrepreneurs in this country in that sense. Um, I don't want to discourage the great organizations that are there promoting, but I definitely think that there, there has to be a different mindset to change, to distinguish the type of entrepreneur that there is or the type of opportunity that somebody's looking to do. I think it's almost difficult for somebody to have all these credentials to get access to the money. So I would love to, to see uh, an investment portfolio or a group come in where um, they can do like small amounts of loans, right? Uh, whether it is 500,000, a million shillings, right? Whereby just get people the chance to prove their concept and just to get things going. So I do feel for Sarah and I think that um, there are people much more powerful than me with a lot more ideas that um, I think there's a gap in that market for sure to help them out. Another thing that works very well is finding like-minded people who have the same passion you do for your business idea. So you might have saved 100,000. You might find Anne that has 250. George has 400. How do you come together, assign roles to each other, and grow your business together in an open, honest, and transparent way? Working in partnership can be very, very successful if you do it in the right way. We, we have a question here from Emmanuel Ogangwa. How can I make the right partnership and not fail? What is your view on partnership in business? Very good question. I have not or never been in a partnership till about a year ago. And I think what comes is trust is very important. Lay the foundation first, have good um you know uh, have a a memorandum of understanding between you and your partner and um communication you know keep an open communication about your fears right there is no harm in it right if you believe something's going to work something's not going to work or things are happening your way or you you know if as per your expectations communicate don't let things build up you know handle things or so problems when they're still small you know don't let these um, um, problems or communication gaps compound to something that builds up to something much bigger than you know and have a mutual friend in between as a moderator you know who who understands both of you and can help in case of this in case there's any crisis yeah I think um there's a generational gap, right? So I think um, in our parents' generation, it was a much easier way to trust people, to get into business with them, you know? Um, a handshake was worth a lot, right? I think things have changed a lot. Uh, I think it is more challenging. Um, I've been in the experience where I was in a partnership and it, um, it was a disaster. Um, it failed badly. Uh, but I did also um pick up some of my best lessons in life so there was a positive side um for me i think if you're going to go to a partnership especially with a friend or with people that you know i think you have to follow vic's comment here i think before you even put one shilling in that business i think you guys just need to write an agreement write in a document write absolutely everything including the most dangerous word which is like in case we fall out in case it fails, right? This is what it is. Don't just write the good stuff. You've also got to write the precautions. Um, so yeah, so I think is you can do it, but make sure you do the diligence. We're going to take our final question from Jeffrey Boguer. I have a side business, but supervision becomes a challenge due to the demand of my current job. How can I ensure effective supervision even when I have my, my own job? I think this is a lot of people can relate to this, right? I think a lot of people are in a position in their life where that extra side job is uh, key and to get the money. Um, so my, my experience here with that is systems, right? 
um, don't invest your money in a side job if you don't have a system. Uh, and a system can be something as simple as uh, just a book where it records everything uh, or an accountability, right? Or a random spot check. So I think it's um, you have to have systems in place. Yeah. I, I think another thing that works very well is the key people in your team, give them an opportunity to grow with you. So let's say you have a supervisor, you're doing a small hardware business. Um, say, you know, if you're with me for two years, I'll give you an opportunity for profit share. In your third year, I'll give you 5%, then 10% in your fourth and your fifth. So the, they themselves see why they need to grow with you, but always follow through on your promise. The worst thing you can do as an entrepreneur is promise something and don't deliver. Just to sum up the day, are there any last words of advice you can give to our audience before we hand back to the NSSF team? Um, look, I think um, if you have a great idea, if you have the passion, and I think that's key here is the passion. If you're solving a problem, I think follow your dreams, right? Um, there's a likelihood it will fail, but don't be that person who said, uh, I didn't try. Just give it a try because if it if it doesn't work out, it's okay. And my big advice really is the younger you are, the braver you are, the bolder you are. Um, when you get a bit older, when you have a family, you have responsibilities, you know, failing is a problem, right? So I think if you are young, you have the ambition and the drive, you know, go for it. And I think Africa is an amazing place um, for you to try that. Um, we have a fantastic um, like middle class that is growing. We have also a unique part where we're all entrepreneurs somehow because every day we're trying to survive by doing a deal. So go for it. Um, I encourage it, yeah. For me, Azar, I think uh, the tip I would give is hard work. You know, the, the journey to the summit is taking one difficult step at a time. And, you know, you need patience for that and you need discipline you know that's my second point that it's doing the right thing over and over again it's not about one big win it's about small wins every day it's about the one percent every day so have the discipline and you will see the gains and put in the hard work thanks wow that's some great insight from our panelists today thank you very much for your time this is the first session we're having. We're going to have one every month for the next six months. So please join us next time and grow with us and let's all grow together. We'll hand it back. Thank you so much, EO. Thank you so much, Azar. Thank you so much, Vic. And thank you so much, Andre. I hope I've said all the names correctly. Thank you for sparing your time out of your way busy schedule. I was listening to you and at some point Vic said, I don't have time and I'm like, wow, we are humbled and we are honored to have you here today. Um, um, I'm here to just give a few closing remarks. Um, I hope we've picked all the tips that they have given to us and I hope we grow to be better entrepreneurs and better individuals and even to the employees. I like uh, this uh, discussion because it has picked on almost everything. It has picked on the employer it has picked on the starting entrepreneur. It has picked on the employee yourself. So it has spoken um, entrepreneurship money, business money, even personal finance. I am so glad that we had a chance to have you and host you. And uh, we should look forward for the next six. Okay, there are now five months because we've done this month. For the next five months, uh, January will be here again, same time on the 21st of January. And we'll be speaking, setting, winning, and your strategies so business people please log in but also people who are just thinking of starting please log in this might be the talk that will actually push you to start um i've also liked the parting remarks discipline that's a very good point hard work and andreas go says go for it um just uh one thing a tradition that we have for everyone that we host uh you leave um, a book that you've read that has inspired you let's say that since we're talking business in the line of business that has um, kept you thinking or helped you to grow yourself. Um, I'll start with Andres. 
uh, Rich Dad, uh, Poor Dad. Great book for young entrepreneurs, yeah. I'm a keen reader. There are quite a few that come to my mind. Um, but I think um, I'm a big fan of Tony Robbins. So pick any to Tony Robbins book, transformational, very powerful, life-changing. Thank you. For me, there's a book I recently read on habits. I forget the name, but I think it's called 30 Day Habits. But apart from books, I really think that there are so many amazing podcasts, YouTube videos, just YouTube, entrepreneurship, how to grow your business, business strategy. These are the things and tools that will help you guys grow. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to our wonderful audience. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for sticking with us for these two hours. For those who, uh, if you know someone who has missed, this will be stay on our NSSF YouTube page. Please go on there, rewatch, tell your friends to watch because there were so many good insights that were shared. Uh, thank you to all our audience and uh, we wish you a Merry Christmas and a happy 2021, 2022 rather. Thank you. Bye.